morning. The psalmist has written, I will lift mine eyes up unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And our own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was especially concerned that his closest friends and loved ones, the disciples, would understand about life and afterlife and about death and after death. And so he said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For I'm going now to my father's house, which is a mansion in which there are many rooms, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. There's never a good day or a right day to have a funeral, especially a funeral for a beloved dad and father and friend, especially of a loved one who died too soon and too young. But to have Peter's funeral on Maundy Thursday in the middle of Holy Week, just before Easter, provides a powerful symbol and message and focus. You may remember that Lent began with Ash Wednesday, which is about our mortality. That's why we call it Ash Wednesday from the famous reminder, from earth you came to earth you shall return, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And tomorrow, Good Friday, despite its optimistic sounding title, is also about mortality, Jesus' death this hard reminder that the good die young and that there are challenges in life that are just plain unjust and unfair. Maundy Thursday today is not quite as daunting, but it is foreboding and dramatic. Jesus and his friends were celebrating Passover and ever since the Jewish Passover and Christian Last Supper have been a blend worth remembering. For the Jewish people, Passover reminds us that the angel of death passed over the Israelites. God's promises were kept, and the people found their way to the promised land. For Christian people, the Last Supper, what we call Holy Communion, has Jesus taking the bread and the cup of the Passover meal and offering them as symbols of his own sacrifice on the cross. Both Holy Communion and Passover have one main rule to remember. God tells the Jewish people repeatedly, remember, remember, remember. And Jesus, after giving the disciples the bread and the cup, tells them, do this in remembrance of me. And that's at the heart of our gathering today. We are here to remember. To remember Peter, to remember Peter and Jen, to remember Peter and Riley and Jack and younger Peter, and to remember the youngest, newest Peter, Peter Hein, born on older Peter's birthday. And if you saw that photo of big Peter cradling littlest, newest Peter in his arms, then you've seen our Peter's life in full display. A life lived with love, a life well worth living, a life that made its mark, and a life that lives on. Which brings us to the other end of Holy Week, the power of Easter. Easter exists for one reason, to say loud and clear that God's love is greater than death itself. I don't know where you might be on the continuum of faith, but I'm sure with hundreds of people here today, if we mapped out a faith continuum, we would be at hundreds of different points along the way. Easter is a miracle. There's no earthly explanation for it. That's why it's called a miracle. It makes no sense. You can't think your way into believing it. It's about a young man, a young man, Jesus, a good fellow, popular, accomplished, who died on Good Friday. It was unnecessary and unjust and unfair. The death left his whole town in mourning. His friends and peers were beside themselves as we are today his family heartbroken and bereft. That's the Good Friday that we all experience from time to time in our lives. Too often, truthfully, Good Friday deaths are the hardest of all. Then comes Easter. With sorrow still running deep and with death still very close, we today are confronted by Easter. The miracle of Easter, the impossibility of Easter, the improbability, the e illogic of Easter, that resurrection can be stronger than crucifixion, that joy can be stronger than sorrow, or that love can be stronger than death. Maybe you believe it, maybe you don't. Maybe on that 
continuum of faith, you're on the, I hope it's true side, or I don't know, but it sounds nice side. Or maybe you remember that college classroom being taught that religion is a crutch. Religion is the opiate of the masses. Well, I don't know about opium, but I am grateful for my Tylenol every morning. I don't need a crutch, but I use my trusty cane every day. There are times that we need the whimsy of faith and the mystery and the stretch and the hope of faith. And if you find yourself today not able to reach that far yet, if resurrection and heaven seem a bit much, then read the letter that Peter's mom wrote in the bulletin. Read the obituary that the family wrote so beautifully. Think about why you are here today. And then maybe agree that God should make heaven today for Peter Corbett. A sports complex, perhaps, <laughs> where we can all gather and all play. And miracle of miracles, we're all winners, like Peter. Shall we turn now in our hymn books to number 546, as we often do to try to sing our faith through the tears? Number 546, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. <laughs> As you remain standing, if you'll turn again in your bulletin to the responsive reading of the 23rd Psalm, there's a part for me, a part for you as the congregation, and then a prayer that we say together at the end. The 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the, in the shelter, shelter of, of your, your presence, presence 
May we find the peace to be renewed in our hope and strengthened in our faith. May we take from our memories of Peter a wellspring of joy for all of his life and for all that we shared, we give thanks. May the same love that now holds him close surround us in this hour. Amen. Amen. May be And as we enter into a time of memory and story and gratitude and love, we invite Brad forward to begin this time of remembrance. Dear Pete, I've got really good news for you. I am not your only friend. <laughs> your funeral service was insane. We, you filled a church and a huge tent outside. Miracle. Uh, Jennifer asked me to speak at it, and when she did, I got very emotional and told her absolutely. And then I told her I deserved it and, th and that you would have wanted me to. <laughs> I think she thought that was funny. Just know that it was the honor of my life. Jennifer told me that she wanted me to be me when I spoke. I wasn't exactly sure what that meant, but to me, being me at your funeral service was me finding a way to celebrate what you did in your life and your life in general, because it was a good one. You didn't have to bail on us at 61, but man, you crushed it. I'm trying to keep the grief and the sadness from allowing everyone to focus on what you were as a husband, a father, a brother, a son, a grandfather, and a friend. You made your life what it was. Someone once said we were all about as happy as we choose to be. You made a lot of the right decisions from the beginning to the end. To be fair, you had a lot of advantages. You were born very good looking. You didn't have to fight weight issues. You didn't have bad acne. You were very smart, had great parents, great siblings, and it wasn't exactly like you were clawing your way out of poverty. <laughs> that I can assure you. Your number one best decision ever came when we were seniors in high school and we were picking colleges. Out of nowhere, you chose DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana, of all the places in the world. Not sure exactly how this came to be from one of the smartest kids in our class, but you picked it. You said it was the Harvard of the Midwest. <laughs> really, Pete? The Harvard of the Midwest? Okay, let's go with that. I think you just wanted me to feel bad that I basically had to just enroll at Ithaca. <laughs> also, I might be the only one who knows you got rejected from your non number one choice. But don't worry, I will forever keep that between us, and thank God you did get rejected. Anyhow, think of the faith that was involved in choosing this hillbilly college. Remember back then that every dorm floor had landlines. There were no cell phones, so students would reserve time on Sunday nights to call their parents to tell them how they were doing or whatever. Well, you and I would use that time to call each other. We were always setting up how we were going to see each other. Sort of embarrassing when you think about it, because we were like little girls, but we were who we were. <laughs> Anyhow, I think it was our sophomore year when you called and told me you had a new girlfriend. I said, well, what does she look like? You went on and on about how she had a great smile, she was funny, blah, blah, blah. And I said, Pete, we're in college. Who cares about any of that stuff? <laughs> Tell me how she looks. <laughs> Both you and Jennifer decided to go to DePauw for no reason that made any sense, but it ended up being the perfect decision and your best one. There would be no young Pete, Riley or Jack, no Lulu or Viv, Vivian, and no very young, young Pete. I don't know what we call him, but the youngest Pete. <laughs> By the way, the video of you meeting your namesake grandson, <clears throat> who shares 
Your birthday, called it a miracle, was shared by tons of people. And let me tell you, it caused the share price of Kleenex to go through the roof. One of the incredible stories of all time. So let's back to your great life. It was a Jennifer decision followed by many others that were in your control. Nice job, friend. I have to tell you that where it hurts the most for me is thinking about Jennifer without you. I know she will be strong. I got to barrel through this part. She will be strong and she will continue living the way she knows how to live. But thinking of her without you is tough. And thinking of you, me, Missy, and Jennifer not doing things together, that really hits me. I have a unique way of distracting myself when I'm sad about things, but blocking this part out isn't easy. I will share with your kids that you told me you were not worried about them. They will be fine, you said. For you to say that means so much more than just the words. It means that you are proud of how you and Jennifer raised them and that you are proud of them, period. From a father to his kids, those are the money words. I have a confession to make. When our friendship started decades ago, I have to admit that I liked the things you had as much as I liked you. <laughs> now, you were a great kid, but the whole package was pretty sweet. I, I remember the first time we got together, we first met at your dad's place in row eight, and, and when I came there with the felts, you and I hit it off, and you invited me to your mom's house shortly after. I remember it was yesterday when my dad dropped me off. I remember getting out of the car on Pointer Woods Road and just gazing forward at the house. It was this magical white colonial that was just perfect. It had a split rail fence in the front that enclosed an incredible front yard. I started to walk down the long driveway that was to the right and everything was going in slow motion. As I made my way down the very long driveway to the back of the house, I turned left toward the backyard and there was a beautiful pool sort of elevated with a pool house. And as I looked closer, I saw Mimi and several of her friends laying out by the pool. <laughs> I said to myself, this day is getting better by the second. <laughs> Finally, I saw you and your mom in the family room, and that room would become our hangout for thousands of hours. It was at that time that you involuntarily became my best friend. And I should mention that it wasn't long after that I had your mom wrapped around my finger too. <laughs> By the way, Missy and I visited your mom last week. The good news is she is very with it for her age. She doesn't want to hear that, but she's very with it. The bad news is that she's very with it, and she misses you. We had a few laughs and lots of hugs, and I commit to you that we will be back up there to see her soon. Pop was battling a few things, so we were unable to see him, but we will. Both of them were a major part of your life, and you were one of a kind son. You got that right, too. I had a great laugh the other day thinking about something that I might be the only one who would laugh at this. I might be the only one who would ever laugh at this, but I had this thought of you arriving in heaven and them telling you there were no books up there and that you couldn't read. <laughs> I hated when you read and you loved to do it more than anything. <laughs> you and Mimi, so annoying. I would tell you that reading directions on how to build something or which exit to get off on the highway is fine, but sitting on a couch and reading was just stupid, especially... <laughs> if you read 300 pages about something that never actually happened. <laughs> you would say to me, I was not worth arguing with over the topic. You would tell me to just go run around the house and waste time like I always did. <laughs> Our connection to each other was laughter. We had the same sense of humor, and we let that connection drive almost every one of our million conversations. <clears throat> I could get you to laugh at anything. You mostly laughed at me at me. This was from a very young age, uh, young age. Like everyone else in life, we went through some tough stuff, like the loss of our brothers, Brett and Jeff. It was so cool that you were so close to Brett and me to Jeff. I love thinking about that. During those times, we'd reach out to each other automatically, but we found a way to keep it light, very light, so that we looked forward to the next conversation. We helped each other navigate tough times without even knowing we were doing it. Well, now I know it, and I'll miss it. Back to Jennifer for a second. Just a heads up that I'm going to tell her that not a day went by when you didn't tell me how much you loved her cooking. I know you never did really say that, but she needs to hear some good things right now, so we're going to tell her that. <laughs> Wanted to make sure you're okay with that. 
I told someone the other day who didn't know you, but knew who you were and that you were a very good friend of mine, that all anyone had to see was you from January of 2023 to understand everything about you. I recall the exact moment uh, you and Jennifer called Missy and I to share the news. I remember exactly where we were. As you went through the battle, I was shocked and blown away at how positive you were, how humble you were, what an incredible family man you were, how much you were absolutely loved by Jennifer and your kids. I remember seeing Lulu and Vivian jumping all over you. I know from being a part of many group chats how many people were pulling for you, but what I remember the most is how friggin' tough you were. Still blows my mind. And to the point of that toughness, I want to know because of you, I stopped taking the 40 milligrams of Lipitor I used to take every day, hoping that one day I'd just drop. There's no way I'm going to go through what you did. Only you could do that. We weren't really huggers, but when I saw you last, <clears throat> we ended the visit with a hug. Uh, it was short way after, this was shortly after we laughed out loud at one of those dumb commercials on TV about people practicing not to become their parents. <laughs> yep, we laughed out loud at that, whistling through the graveyard once again. This is how we did it. Speaking of us, of us not hugging, remember last year when we went to the Greenbrier with Missy and Jen and the girls scheduled a massage for us? When we arrived at the spa, they told us we had two men who were going to do our massages. <laughs> you and I looked at each other and ran out of that place like it was on fire. <laughs> now, I don't know what's up with us. Like always, we had a blast, and like always, you and I laughed a lot. I'm so proud of our friendship. <clears throat> I think about how we left our kids with a good model for how to treat friends. Always call, always answer, and always laugh. It's the longest note I've ever written, but you deserve it. Everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here today to celebrate Pete. We're, uh, we're all so proud of him and the way he lived his life. Uh, I'm Mimi, Pete's sister and Jeff's sister. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'd like to take a moment out to just acknowledge um, two special people who couldn't be here today because uh, they couldn't travel. And that's my mom, Barb, and my dad, Pete. They were the ones who gave us my special brother. Um, I was hoping maybe we could just, they're, they're here in spirit and they're watching this on video right now. So I was thinking maybe we could just take a second and everybody wave and say, hi, Barb. Hi, Pete. Uh, I know they will love that. Um, okay, so I'm not the best speaker, so. Uh, I am gonna read a poem that I saved quite some time ago because it inspires me to live my life the way Pete lived his life. And the poem is called The Dash by Linda Ellis. Maybe some of you heard it before. <clears throat> I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent alive on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live in love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? 
for you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they said about how you spent your dash? I promise I'll get through this. <laughs> There's so much that can be said, and yet so little that needs to be. We're all here because we know who my father was through his words and his actions. My dad was an astounding person who saw no limit to the potential in himself and everyone he met. The possibilities were endless with him. I've been lucky to spend the majority of my career working alongside him learning the ins and outs of his businesses and solving problems together, side by side. The lessons that I've learned through my father, both personally and professionally, are ones that I will carry with me throughout my lifetime and pass along to the generations that succeed me. As many of you have articulated through your texts and calls over the past few weeks, PTK was a legend, exposing so many of us to new challenges and experiences while showing us constantly that the possibilities really were endless with him. He was both a father and a friend. There are countless qualities that I admire in my father, but most important was how I saw he treated, cared for, and helped others every day. And this was not a part-time gig for him. This was his mission statement and why he was and always will be my idol. Dad, Thank you for everything you've done for me, and I'll always love you. I can't promise I'll get through this, but I'll try. The name Peter means the rock. Never in my life have I met someone who fits their name more than my dad. He was our rock, and when I say our, I'm pretty sure I speak on behalf of not just my immediate family, but of many people in this room here today. He was an extraordinary man, so extraordinary, that as Alita put it to me last week, he almost seemed immortal. The only sensible reason I can come up with for this unimaginable loss is that God was looking for a new councilman, and there was no one better than Peter Corbett. <laughs> My dad had the presence of a president. He carried himself with this understated confidence that just made you feel as though anything in the world could be thrown your way, and he'd just know how to handle it. He had the wisdom of a modern-day philosopher. His perspective was always principled, rooted in logic and empathy. I can't tell you how many people have shared how my dad helped them get sober, mend relationships, navigate career, family, and life challenges. He had the ability and competitive spirit of a professional athlete. In his 40s, we'd go to the high school football field, and he'd throw an Eli Manning-style pass or kick a professional-length field goal. Throughout his 50s, he was hiking mountains, kayaking states long distances, winning club championship tennis and paddle tournaments, and making all of our 20 and 30 something year old friends jealous of his strength, endurance, and frankly, physique. <laughs> <laughs> and as a 60 year old man battling the most aggressive cancer out there, he was setting up these absurd tension rope workouts in our backyard after countless rounds of chemo, 
and walking him into his oncologist's office to discuss not his cancer, but the length of his daily Peloton rides. <laughs> I heard his doctor say on more than one occasion, well, I certainly can't say I treat other patients like you, Peter. My dad had the intellectual horsepower of an astrophysicist, the competence of a Fortune 500 CEO, the fight of a world champion boxer. He was warm, resi resilient, <clears throat> so giving, full of integrity. I could go on and on. They say that the average person meets 80,000 people in their lifetime. Well, my dad could fill a stadium, not with people he merely encountered, but with whom he had a positive and lasting impact. Now, my dad may not have been a president or a professional athlete or some of these other things, but what he did, he gave his all to and then some. And here's the most important part of my dad's story. From the time he was 19 years old, the only thing that mattered to him was my mom and the life they built together. They were just two kids from Fairfield County who found each other at a tiny school out in Indiana. Shortly after my mom's arrival, my dad spotted this brown-haired beauty smoking Marbreds and listening to Shake Down Street <laughs> out a third-story window. The Virgo girl who held the world in a paper cup. That's Jen Lucas from Greenwich, his friend told him. He struck up a conversation the next opportunity he got and learned that she was indeed the little sister of the crazy Lucas twins he had played sports with growing up. <laughs> the rest is history, and the love story that ensued is one made for the big screen. They gave us all something to strive for. <sighs> the morning before he passed, my parents lay in bed and the topic of their favorite memory together came up. My mom shared first, and after about 20 minutes of rehashing many favorite memories, my dad fell asleep and never got to share his. But that was it, that was what he adored so much, her. This petite little ball of energy, not to be underestimated for even a second. My dad was Superman and we always knew it, but if there's one thing these past 15 or so months revealed, it's that she was his superwoman counterpart. You should have seen this woman after 13 sleepless nights in the hospital, operating like an absolute machine, and still looking gorgeous as ever somehow. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Together, they fought like hell, and they cared for one another like no one else could. I remember early on after his diagnosis, my mom said to me, you know, honey, I could go to sleep crying every night, but I refused to do that. And so she didn't, and neither did he. Instead, they traveled, laughed, danced, and just lived. Talk about honoring your vows every single day. I don't yet know how to live my life without my dad, this rock of ours, this force of a man who I felt an otherworldly connection to. The morning of my wedding, I wrote him a letter and in it I said, the moment I came into this world, I believe that by some unexplainable mechanism, my soul was attached to yours. I can't quote these remarks without acknowledging that the gift of my life was watching my dad become the grandfather to my three children that he was destined to be. And that with my oldest daughter, Lulu, in particular, I got to watch that indescribable soul connection I felt unfold between the two of them. Lucky for us, souls transcend time and space and his will never leave us. My dad was the greatest father, pop, husband, brother, son, and friend we all could have dreamed of. May he continue to be our grounding force, our guiding light, our rock, as he rests now with angel wings. We love you, Dad. In these moments now, as we listen to Somewhere Over the Rainbow, I invite you to use this time to bring to mind all the moments you laughed with Pete, all the ways he touched your life, and all that we have to be grateful for.
Almost 12 years ago, in the fall of 2012, Peter Corbett preached in this church from right over there. I know you know the many and varied talents of Pete Corbett, but you may not have known that preaching was among those talents. But let me tell you, on September 26, 2012, he preached it. It was what we call Appalachia Sunday here, a Sunday in September when I invite a few of the people who have participated in our summer service trip to West Virginia to get up here and tell their stories from the week, to give, a pe give people a glimpse of what it means to go and serve. And I knew I wanted Pete to be one of the speakers because I don't know how else to say it, but that Pete got it. Pete got what it meant to serve with joy, with your heart wide open, and I wanted him up here preaching it. It had been a particularly challenging Appalachia trip that year. A ferocious storm had swept through West Virginia right before our arrival, knocking out power all over the state. Pete and Jack and a whole host of others, including my son, ended up in a school with no power and no running water, and that lasted for days. But throughout, and this won't surprise you, throughout, Pete was unfailingly positive and utterly focused on serving the people that we had come to help. And when he stood up here to speak, to preach, he didn't talk about how miserable and hot and really smelly that school had been. He didn't even talk about the construction work that they'd done on a dilapidated West Virginia home. What he talked about was the family they had served. What he talked about was the teenage boy in the family they served. This boy was withdrawn and quiet, uneasy with all the strangers in his home, and Pete had made it his goal to find a connection to show that boy that this stranger from Connecticut was ready to be his friend. And he did it. He connected. Are you surprised? Pete Corbett reached that kid. And that was what Pete stood up here and preached about, not the house he'd built, but the connection he'd built with a lonely kid in an Appalachian holler. Pete talked about what it meant that by the end of the week that boy was completely at home with these strangers in his home, laughing and at ease and showing them all his favorite swimming hole. Pete talked about that being the most powerful God moment of his week. And what struck me then, in that summer when I first recognized how amazing Pete Corbett was, what struck me was Pete's incredible capacity to see people, to see that kid who needed some extra care, and not just that boy on the work site, but honestly, other kids on that trip, too, who needed a little extra compassion. When we speak, as we all have been doing in these past days, when we speak of Pete's kindness and his intrinsic goodness, of his utter integrity and sense of fairness, what we are speaking of is a man who truly saw the people around him. And more than that, a man who made others feel seen. Pete Corbett lived with his heart wide open to others and his eyes wide open to who they were and, and what they needed and what he could do for them. But it wasn't only that he saw people for who they were. It was that, as his mom so beautifully wrote, he always chose to see the best in people and therefore brought out the best in all of us. Pete lived with his heart and his eyes and his spirit wide open to the people around him. He lived as we are created to live fully in connection, fully alive to this world and the people in it, just fully, eyes wide open, heart wide open. I wish I could tell you 
why it is that in a world created for good, there is such a thing as cancer. Why someone as wonderful, as cherished, and as needed as Peter Corbett is gone from us too soon. I, I wish I could tell you why, but I, I don't know why. What I do know is this, and this, this is what we are to hang on to fiercely with as much tenacity as Pete hung on to life. That the life of Peter Corbett, in which you all shared, has not come to an end. That he is safe and well held and cherished by the God who loves him with as great a love as Pete loved you. I know this, I know that this amazing man who loved so fiercely and lived so fully and saw his world so clearly now is himself fully seen by the one who created him. I know this, I know that Pete is in a place of joy where his brother Jeff has made him welcome and where one day, one day, we will all be gathered with him and with all those we love, and there will be no more tears and no more goodbyes. And until then, until then, our task is simple. To live as he lived. To live as Pete lived. To live with our eyes wide open to the people around us, to the beauty around us, to the love around us. To live completely and exuberantly and fully and joyfully. To laugh and to love and to learn and to see one another fully. To live people as Pete Corbett lived, so shall he then live forever among us. Will you join with me now in prayer? Let us pray. God of, of love and memory, God of all moments and of this moment, God of laughter and of tears, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Peter Corbett, a child of your love, shaped by your hands, breathed into life by your spirit, and placed here as a gift to us. In him, we saw life lived as you would want us all to live, for he lived with passion and joy, with openness and laughter, with compassion and hope and integrity. You placed him into this world to love and to live fully, and he did. You gave him to us to be loved, and he was, oh, he was. So thank you. Thank you. But dear God, this is hard. As our hearts are broken, we know yours breaks too. So please be with us. Embrace with your love all those whose grief in this moment is so heavy. Most especially, we ask your presence with his family and your strength with Jen. God, long ago you promised many rooms in your home and, and one for each of us. So help us to see beyond this world to that place of welcome where Pete now is. Help us to let go of him with trust and to place him in your care. And when we go from this place, lighten our grief. Grant laughter again and give us the hope to live bravely through all our days until we are gathered with those we love in the life to come. In your loving name we pray, and we say together the words your son taught us.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's my joy to invite Judd forward to the piano. Testing. Morning, everybody. I'm so grateful to the Corbett family for allowing me to do this today. Allowing me. Asking me. It, it reminded me of a quick, I'm going to give you a quick uh, Peter Corbett story as I set this up. And um, Every time I go to his house, he so admired me and music. Obviously, we had this musical connection. And he would always ask me, we'd be by the fire, and he said, Joe, go to the living room and play the piano. And I'd go to the living room and I'd try to play the piano. And it would be so out of tune that it would make the dog Eddie's ears, you know. <laughs> so Peter, that piano hasn't, been, piano hasn't been tuned since Riley was in elementary school. Tune it and I'll play it. Well, this piano is tuned, my friend. This piano is tuned, so. Here we go. I dreamed you, I saw your face, caught my lifeline when drifting through space. I saw an angel, I saw my faith, I came on. I floated away across an ocean. I dreamed your name. I followed an angel down through the gates. I can only thank God. Sing a little song of loneliness, sing when they make me smile. Another round for everyone, we're here for a little while. Now I'm walking this street on my own. But he's with me wherever I go. Yeah, I found my angel. I found my place. I can only thank God it was not too late. I can only thank God it was not too late. I can only thank God. Judd and Jimmy get set up for the next song. We want to make sure you know that you're in on this one. If you'll open in your bulletin to the final song, you'll see that, um, first of all, it's, it's the perfect song for Pete Corbett, Not Fade Away. There is nothing about Pete's life and love and living in this world that will ever fade away. So we're going to sing it in his honor, and uh, we'll do our best. 
As he would want. As he would want. And featuring Jimmy Corbett. Amazing. see you at the reception as we continue to share stories, share laughter, share tears, and lean on one another. And now, friends, may the light which shone so brightly in Pete's life shine in your life. May the love that lifted him lifted you. And may God's peace be with you in this moment and forevermore.